Our next subject is uh, weed warfare. And our speaker is Katie Kamler. Katie is an extension field horticultural specialist in the southeastern part of Missouri. And as such, uh, does a lot of uh, work in, in what I'll call practical research. I know Katie is participating in um, research effort on lavender as a cash crop or so forth. And whenever you talk about any plant, you have to talk about weeds, which um, are an unfortunate fact of life. So with no further comment, I see that Katie has her screen pulled up and we'll introduce to you Katie Kamler. All right, uh, weed warfare. This is probably one of the biggest questions that are our most common questions I get into the office. People bring in plants and say, what is this? A lot of times they don't actually care what it is. They just want to know how to get rid of it. Well, the reality is you have to know what it is in order to best uh, figure out your best management options. Uh, this is a picture that I love to use a lot on this title slide. If you uh, look closely, you can see the strawberries mixed in with the clover. And uh, so, so this is a good example of um, pretty extreme weed problems and a problem that we don't have a good solution to. So we'll talk more about that as we go along. So what is a weed? The broad definition is, is any plant growing out of place. If it is not where you want it, it can be called a weed. So that can include trees, that can include um, a desirable flower. If it's not where you want it, it is a weed. So an example of that is corn in a soybean field. Corn is a valuable agronomic crop, but if it's in a soybean field, it is a weed and can be a problem for harvest for many other reasons. What weeds do, they are undesirable from an aesthetic standpoint. So sometimes they can be, it looks overgrown, it looks ugly, um, it looks uh, weedy. Uh, they rob desirable plants like nutrients, water. They compete with what we want. Uh, they can reduce yields or smother out our desirable plants. They can also harbor insect and disease issues that can go after our desirable plants. Uh, they can lower crop yields um, by that competition. They can interfere with cultural practices such as harvesting. I use an example of this in high school. I worked for a commercial pumpkin grower and there was one pumpkin field that was completely covered in cocoa burrs. Guess what? We were not thrilled to have to pick that and it was a nightmare. Uh, so um, it can interfere that way. It can also reduce the quality of harvested product. Uh, it can be uh, that our desirable crops can be smaller uh, because of that competition. It can be um, it's harvesting or harboring insects, pest insects that uh, can damage our, our uh, crop. It can also contribute to uneven crop maturity. So uh, competition is causing um, this plant that should have everything ripe at a certain time that no, nope, this one's ripe, that one's ripe, this one's ripe, and it keeps going and that makes it harder to harvest also. One good thing about weeds, they can aid in erosion control and they can attract, uh, um, in some cases they can attract other pests. Uh, you know, if uh, an overgrown area can lead to um, habitat for wildlife that also likes our, uh, our desirable crops. Why are weeds hard to control? They are very, very good at what they do. Uh, they have large efficient root systems. If you've ever tried to pull up Johnson grass, uh, you, you figure that out. Uh, they grow very rapidly. Uh, it's amazing that you can um, have a, a nice clean seed bed one day and the next day it will be completely covered with germinated seeds. Weeds uh, produce tremendous amounts of seed. An example of this would be a ragweed plant can produce 50 to 100,000 seeds, one plant. 
Uh, they can tolerate drought or low fertility. It does not matter to um, that plant. Uh, they, they can make it out in the parking lot where I parked uh, coming here today. They can, uh, it's fun to, even this time of year, I'll drive down the highway and you can see plants growing out of the cracks in the highway. So they are very efficient at what they do and um, desirable areas don't necessarily matter to them. Um, they can survive anywhere. Little energy is used in producing lush foliage, large seeds or fruit, many times on, on um, some of our, our peskiest weeds. And remember, first identify that weed and consider why it might be thriving. So in horticulture, we have a lot of challenges for weed management. Um, uh, if you uh, join this talk to think that there was a magic bullet to control the weeds, I'm afraid to tell you that that's not the case. It is um, a group management and thinking through a lot of processes. So in horticulture crops, we have few herbicides that are registered. Um, and to think about this in this way, you know, corn acreage is around uh, at least 95.9 .9 million acres. And that was back in 2012. But grape acreage, uh, so especially horticulture crop in 2010, was less than a million acres. Uh, so, and the other thing is we have so many different varieties of horticulture crops in different environmental conditions. It um, makes it hard to have any uh, herbicides that are going to help us in a lot of cases. And uh, you need to re-register herbicides and their food issues or food safety issues, all of those things. And then, uh, you know, in horticulture, a lot of times we use crop rotation to help with weed management. But perennial crops, such as the picture here um, with blackberries, make it difficult to rotate. And perennial crops have a different set of challenges for weed management. We also have a lot of special conditions for production. Uh, so these are commercial examples. But you can also think about this in your own home garden. So high tunnels provide a different weed management strategy than field production. And uh, you can get weeds even in greenhouses in those high tunnels. We think they're protected. We can get weeds in flower pots. Uh, we, weeds, once again, are very good at what they do. And uh, in these pictures, you can also see they're using several weed management strategies, but mulches and different types, which we'll talk about. Uh, weeds can mimic uh, the crop in growth habit and appearance. So here's my favorite picture that I took at a site visit, and I have uh, gotten a lot of mileage out of this picture. So this was strawberries and uh, the clover. And the reality is that there are no solutions for this problem. Uh, this is planning before you plant. So if you had an area that had clover in it, you're going to need to control that before you plant a crop like strawberries. You're also needing to look at what other management of weeds are out there. Remember, it's a systems approach. You are uh, thinking about a lot of different things. Uh, weed control also uh, may be necessary for a safety concern. Uh, hopefully you, you never uh, run into that copperhead on the left uh, because of weeds. But I know that one on the right, poison ivy is my nemesis. Uh, I really break out badly with poison ivy. And uh, it is one that I see that if, if I see it, it must go. Uh, so those safety concerns uh, and uh, may be an issue also. So knowing that plant is uh, essential to figuring out how to control it. So weeds are characterized in some cases by their growing habits. So we have annuals and in annuals, we have summer annuals and winter annuals. We also have biennials and perennials. So annuals, they don't overwinter. They must grow from seed each year. And in that, I said we have summer annuals. Summer annuals germinate in the spring. They make seed and die in the fall. So these are the ones that have seed on them now. They're setting their seed for next year. They're getting ready to go. We're getting cooler temperatures. 
So some common examples include crabgrass, foxtail, pigweed, uh, all that can be problems in, in our uh, lawns and landscapes and gardens. Winter annuals. Winter annuals uh, germinate in the fall or early winter. They make seed in the early spring and die before summer. So if I go out right now, I can see some of these winter annuals starting to germinate and come up right now. So examples include henbit, chickweed. Uh, so this top picture, uh, purple, it's one's henbit, the other one's purple dead nettle. Uh, a lot of times uh, they are growing in the same spots and we see those purple fields in the spring. So this is one I get a call about a lot of times. Uh, the reality is uh, one Tamara showed it in hers as a early flower for pollinators. It's one of the early things that blooms. The other reality is it's growing over winter where most of the time we don't have a desirable crop out there. And by the time you see it blooming in the spring, it's setting seed. Uh, there is no reason to really control it by that point. It's already heading out. So some others, biennial weeds, they're a two year life cycle. So an example of this is thistle. So the first year they come up in there in a rosette form. So, uh, so basically a circle of flat leaves to the ground. And then that second year, they will send up that shoot and bloom and set seed, and then they die. Perennial weeds, they come back year after year after year. So these are the ones, um, management for these is a little different. Uh, so everybody's familiar with dandelions. Uh, tall fescue could be considered that. Bermuda grass is one that, that I dread. And all of these are perennials, so they come back um, every year. They can reproduce by seed and also reproductive parts. So if you think about uh, Bermuda grass that, that spreads and creeps and has rhizomes, uh, that's how it spreads that way. And it can also spread by seed. We also classify weeds by their appearance. So we have grassy weeds. So, you know, your common grasses, crabgrass, Bermuda grass, um, goose grass, any of those. And then we have broadleaf weeds. So dandelions, plantain, pigweed, lamb's quarter, common ones. Uh, so, so the difference between a grass and a broadleaf is important to know when you're looking at weeds also. So some weed management strategies. Uh, first, identify the weed. Uh, and once again, you, you saw uh, those different classifications, uh, their growth habits, and um, whether they are grass or broadleaf. It's very important to know, to think about how you are going to control them. Uh, also think about why they might be thriving. So compaction favors weeds with tap roots. Cultivation uh, favors weeds with rhizomious roots that spread out. Uh, low soil nutrients and organic matter can favor uh, certain types of weeds. Fallow ground, so um, that garden spot that you walked off and left, uh, it's gonna grow something uh, regardless. This parking lot will grow something if we weren't parking on it all the time. Uh, so the thinking about that environmental part of it. So some strategies, avoidance. I like leaving this, uh, this one in here because uh, sometimes you can avoid weeds for a while. Uh, once again, weeds are good at what they do. So you can avoid for a while, but a lot of times you're going to end up with weeds at some point. Tillage can be helpful. Uh, tillage can, um, can be helpful, but it can also bring more weed seeds to the surface. So it's thinking about how um, that works in your system. Hand pulling, hoeing, uh, some of these can actually be therapeutic. Uh, it is your favorite torture technique for that weed that's bugging you. My number one favorite, however, weed control method is mulch. That could be inorganic mulches like plastic landscape fabric, what have you, or organic mulches. And we'll talk more about those. Mowing, weed eating, uh, digging them out, burning them with hot water or just burning them, uh, using cover crops to provide competition in order that those weeds don't come up. And we're gonna talk some more about some of these individual options.
Uh, this is an example of where multiple strategies would be helpful. So you saw my strawberry picture earlier. This was the same uh, place. This was blueberries. Unfortunately, you can barely see the blueberries. Uh, and once again, the reality here, um, multiple weed control strategies would have been helpful. And it's very sad uh, to um, see this place because there's a lot of money invested into those. They were commercial plantings in order to let it get like this. And this is no longer a viable option. You're actually going to be better off starting from scratch. And that's um, extremely a, a sad situation. And it's also a demonstration of how um, economically damaging weeds can be. Uh, just some fun options. Uh, there are biological control agents out there. Uh, this is an introduction of an agent, insect, or parasite that infects uh, targeted weed, but not a desirable plant. So an example of this, they, they have used this um, musk thistle head weevil. It eats the seed out of the musk thistle, but it is that balance between you have to have enough musk thistles to have a feeding habitat for the head weevil. And when the musk thistle disappears, so does the head weevil because it does no longer has a food source. Um, this is a very targeted uh, approach and uh, doesn't necessarily work for all plants. There, there's very specific examples for that. Cultural weed control, hand pulling. Um, so that's just hand pulling with, with your hands or using different weeding tools. Depending on the weed, uh, it is very important, like in this example of a dandelion, if you do not get the entire root, it's a perennial, it will be back. Uh, and you've seen how dandelion seeds spread. Uh, but dandelion is never one that I have ever worried about as a huge weed problem. There are lots, lots worse weeds out there. Uh, cultivation, proper depth is important. Remember that tillage. So you want to get the root, but not bring more weed seed to the surface. Uh, our soils, uh, we call that, uh, they have seed banks in them. Uh, so that seed uh, is very good at uh, um, germinating when the time is right and when it gets closer to the surface where, where the conditions are right. Timing of weed development. Small is much better. You can control them better. You don't want to, uh, it's much harder to control big weeds uh, than those little weeds. It can be handy to let uh, weeds germinate before planting the main crop. So you allow those weeds to germinate, control those, and then plant your main crop. Ideally, time of day, uh, low humidity, high temperatures, not when we necessarily want to be out uh, pulling weeds or, or um, hoeing weeds or any of that, but it works better. Uh, my example of this in grad school, I uh, did a lot of weed management in vegetable production, and I was told to go hoe out crabgrass in sweet potato trials. It had just rained, it, it was pretty muddy. So yes, I could hoe out the grass fairly easily, but guess what? That laid on the top with clumps of mud on the root, it rained again, it replanted and rerooted itself and I had to go back again. Uh, so this is a, a very good example and that low humidity, high temperature um, would have desiccated that crabgrass roots as opposed to cloudy, muddy uh, weather. Keep your weeding tools sharp. Uh, having good weeding tools is important. There's lots of cool hoes and different weeding tools out there that can make that job a lot easier. And uh, don't till deeper than you need to plant. Remember that soil is a good seed bank and can hold seeds for a long period of time. Mulching, as mentioned, this is my absolute favorite weed control method. Uh, it suppresses weeds, uh, emergence and growth, um, for putting that down. It can reduce disease problems by um, keeping soil particles from splashing onto our plants that can move disease around. 
it can reduce soil erosion, uh, particularly nowadays when it seems like um, when we get rain, it's in huge amounts in a short period of time. So having that cover on the soil can help prevent erosion. It can also help warm or cool the soil, uh, depending on time of year, and uh, conserves moisture, um, which we live in Missouri, and we know that, that our rainfalls in the summer when we need them are even. Uh, so, so keeping that moisture level even is a huge advantage, particularly like in this example, this is straw in tomatoes, and this is my parents' vegetable garden. And um, we use straw uh, every year, uh, and um, that mulch has made a huge difference also on um, that soil composition and adding organic matter back to the soil. Uh, we, organic uh, methods, sawdust, leaves, peat moss, wood chips, hay or straw, compost, pine needles, grass clippings, all of these can be used in a vegetable garden a situation or in landscape uh, beds. It really depends on one, what you want it to look like. Uh, two, uh, what's available locally uh, and um, that ease of application. So they can be incorporated because they're organic uh, into the soil at the end of the season. Although typically we don't see that as much with like wood chips or sawdust. Um, those are, are generally used for a longer lasting mulch. Sometimes there's some concern about nitrogen depletion when we're looking at sawdust or wood chips uh, because nitrogen is used to help break that down. If you see any yellowing plants, it's adding some nitrogen, it's a simple fix. Uh, that living mulch or organic mulch, uh, once again, choose the right material for your situation. What's available? Is it grass clippings off your yard? Is it leaves? Is it straw? Um, cost, um, thinking about um, that cost and the longevity. So, you know, in landscape beds, wood chips or bark uh, last a lot longer and uh, may provide a certain look that you want. Also thinking about that, that appearance, uh, you can also use newspaper, cardboard, or chipboard underneath uh, mulch to add another layer. Those also break down, uh, but it's also, you need to make sure you get those wet um, when you apply them or before you apply them um, so they don't repel water. Remember our mulches, we wanna hold that water in, not um, repel water from it. Uh, and here in this picture, it's grass clippings on uh, around tomatoes. Uh, and that ease of application, uh, it is a, a lot harder to uh, shovel uh, wood chip bark uh, or um, that as opposed to spreading straw a lot of times. So um, there is there is work to it, but it saves work in the long run. Inorganic mulches. So a lot of these are used in commercial vegetable production. Um, black plastic, landscape fabric, white plastic. Uh, so high temperatures can harm plants when mulched with black plastic, but most of our commercial growers uh, use that black plastic in order to uh, boost production, um, warming things up earlier. There's black plastic one side um, with white. Uh, there's also landscape fabric and that allows water to pass through. So with the black plastics, you've got limited irrigation options, which we'll talk about. Advantages, they warm that soil quickly. They provide uh, weed suppression. They can also um, provide moisture retention and possible yield increases where um, looking at even production uh, and even heat across that. Disadvantages are costs. It does limit your irrigation options. Uh, in this example, there would be a drip tape running down the center of that row underneath the plastic. It's difficult to apply soil amendments. So you have to fertilize before uh, you apply that uh, a plastic mulch or you have to uh, fertilize through that irrigation system. It doesn't provide anything like our organic mulch, uh, providing organic matter as you work it back in. Plastic mulch does not do that. And most are not biodegradable, so you have to figure out how to dispose of them. While this is a commercial example, uh, I have quite a few home gardeners that are into, we call it plastic culture, or um, using plastic in their vegetable gardens along with uh, mulch in between the rows or organic mulch in between. 
so there's lots of options out there to help you out and help prevent the, those pesky weeds. Uh, as mentioned, you can do um, both together. So in this case, there is um, the plastic mulch in the rows of vegetables, but in between they have straw. And uh, on the right-hand side, uh, they're using a cover crop in the center of um, those vegetable production rows. And so they're getting having two living crops together. A general mulch guidelines, don't apply mulch in direct contact with the plant. Remember, we do not like volca mulch volcanoes where the, that mulch is touching that plant stem. Think donut, uh, moving that mulch back from that stem. Uh, donuts are, are much tastier and, and more desirable than a volcano. Uh, monitor for disease and overwatering. Uh, remove any weeds before uh, applying mulch. Uh, putting mulch down over a weed that's six, eight inches tall, that, that, that weed's going to win that battle. Uh, so remove any of those before you put the mulch down. Thickness of the mulch is important. It really depends on the material, but the general rule of thumb is three to four inches deep. Uh, other options, I like just having these in here because, uh, you know, uh, your favorite torture technique for that weed, uh, flaming. Uh, flaming can leave uh, advantages, leave soil undisturbed, can be applied before emergence of slow germinating crops. So you could plant seed and, and yet flame weed over the top. They don't have to be burned to a crisp. Uh, and actually, Lincoln University has been doing some research on some flame weeding. Works much better on annual weeds as opposed to perennial weeds, because remember, those perennial weeds usually have a storage system in that root and can come back. If you burn, you're just taking that top off. Um, disadvantages, cost, fuel is heavy. You're dealing with fire. <laughs> so um, things to think about. Animals can actually be effective weeders. However, they are non-discriminatory, so um, they might also get your desirable plants. Uh, goats in particular are being used in a lot of cases with some of our invasive species plants that have become huge problems in specific areas, and goats are pretty good at uh, providing control for some of those. So let's think about sanitation. Uh, you wanna make sure that your seed, if you, uh, you're purchasing seed, is not contaminated with weed seed. One example we have seen quite a bit of this uh, happen is wildlife seed mixtures. So some of those wildlife seed mixtures um, can have uh, a, a, a bigger uh, percentage of weed seeds than we would like. So um, thinking about that source of seed. Uh, you want to prevent the weeds from going to seed in the garden. I know this time of year, I see lots of gardens with lots of weeds in them, and I can uh, testify that mine has weeds in it right now, and they are setting seed. So if we can prevent that, we prevent um, some of the that seed bank, increasing that seed bank for next year. Avoid buying topsoil with weed seeds or uh, weed pieces in it. Uh, example of this, the flower bed right outside my office here, it's a raised bed that we built. Uh, we had some soil brought in and there were chunks of uh, bindweed in it. And we've been here uh, three years, that flower bed's been here and I still battle bindweed continually. Um, because it is a, a problem and it came in with that contaminated uh, soil. Uh, you want to make sure that any manures, if you're using any of that, have been composted completely. That helps remove or heats up and, and destroys some of those weed seeds. And do that fall cleanup of weedy material from the garden. Remember, we really don't want those to set seed and uh, contaminate our uh, system. So integration, um, using crop rotation, those different crops uh, helps uh, um, Outcompete different weeds. Uh, so, you know, uh, onions, garlic, uh, they are not good competitors against weeds where um, 
green beans cover a row and can outcompete some weeds. So it's thinking about crop rotation can help with your weed control um, with that crop competitiveness. So, so thinking about um, what crops compete with weeds better than others. Type and timing of your tillage and cultivation. Remember I talked about temperature and humidity and size of weeds, smaller, much easier. Uh, water and nutrient management uh, can help with, with weed control. And of course, mulches, my favorite weed control method. Uh, so this is just a chart that, that goes through um, how the uh, cycle of weeds can continue and where we can um, get mortality or kill those weeds. Um, so we have seeds and um, they can uh, germinate or they can die of loss of viability if they've been in the seed bank too long or they didn't uptake water or um, some critter ate them. Uh, once they, if we do have germination, those seedlings can be got by cultivation or flame weeding or um, seedling predation by insects or other critters and sometimes diseases. If they do make it to small plants, um, we can get them by cultivation or mowing. Uh, you notice that the options have decreased as the plant got bigger. Large mature plants, uh, you can get some of them by late cultivation or tillage afterwards, but it's a lot harder. And guess what? Those large mature plants have produced seed that goes back around and um, into that soil seed bank. And a lot of seeds do have dormant periods and, and some can remain viable for uh, 50 years or better in that seed bank. So remember, weeds are very good at what they do. Uh, so some crop rotation considerations, you can vary the seasonality of planting. So tillage uh, for spring crops can kill off those winter annuals like annual bluegrass or shepherd's purse or, or um, henbits. Tillage of summer crops can kill off spring germinating weeds like ragweed. Fall crops allows uh, time for midsummer fallow to fight purslane. Purslane has become a huge uh, a weed problem in many of our vegetable gardens. Uh, and burying crops, remember, so, uh, and you have to vary your weed management practices. So you can tine weed or till um, between corn, peas, snap beans, uh, or can cultivate your root crops very closely to the rows. Uh, you can hill up the potatoes or corn. Uh, we think about it with potatoes in the garden, but not as necessarily corn to kill in row reeds. Uh, you can flame reed around corn or alliums, your onions, uh, straw mulch and garlic. Uh, short season crops like lettuce, uh, because they are short, um, typically don't allow um, seed production of weeds because you're planting and then harvesting and planting a different crop. Uh, so that can help. Uh, using those short season crops uh, because it can help prevent any one species from getting out of control. Uh, you can also think about easily weeded crops or competitive crops like potatoes and then cleaning up cro after crops like winter squash where weeds often go to seed because um, they are out there in between the, those vines and uh, typically by that point you, you don't have very good control options so it's going back and cleaning up afterwards that sanitation. Over fertilization, uh, many weed species are highly responsive to soil fertility. Um, weeds often have one and a half to three times higher nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium and calcium concentrations than the crops they are growing with. Remember, they are very, very good at what they do in that competition. Excess fertility can increase weed growth rates. Um, so while our plants need that, our desirable plants need that fertility, the weeds may uh, uh, take advantage of that also. 
Uh, standard management, uh, you reduce weed populations below a level at which they cause notable yield loss. Uh, so most of this is geared toward uh, vegetable production or fruit production because that's uh, a lot of times where we see more weed problems than we do in landscape beds or yards, but that can also, a lot of these can apply to those situations. Uh, weed populations vary greatly between years, and a lot of that is very weather dependent. Uh, yield loss is hyperbolic. There is no threshold. Uh, so it just really depends. Um, so wild oats and wheat uh, in a commercial agronomic situation, yeah, it's a huge problem. It's a contaminant, and they might not even get to sell their, their, their crop because of that. Uh, so it's... it's um, really depends on the weed and what the crop is. Preventative management. Uh, don't allow those weeds to reproduce. If you can prevent them from setting seed, you can get ahead of that weed control game. It requires constant vigilance. And uh, a lot of times when I get home from work, I pull a few weeds from the flower bed uh, every day because I'm walking, I go to the mailbox, oh, that flower bed's got some weeds in it, I'll, I'll pull a few out and um, it is manageable that way. Uh, extra management in early years, getting ahead of that weed and fallow hand rooting uh, any of those weeds out. So those are all great options to help control. And then if, if some of those are not working for you, then it may be a chemical control method. So whether you choose to use herbicides or not is completely up to you and what your production system is. But I like to let everybody know because there's a lot of misunderstanding in how herbicides work and um, actually in how you use them and are effective with them. Uh, so herbicides are classified in three ways. They have a mode of action, which is how it works. They have a range of activity, which is what it works on, and a targeted stage of weed growth. So mode of action, we have um, two classifications. We have contact herbicides. Uh, these mean they kill on contact. They are not absorbed in the plant. They're not translocated or moved through the plant. Very rapid plant deaths. They are temperature dependent. So that label is going to tell you what temperature they need to be applied at. There is little or no soil activity uh, because once again, they're contact only. They control annuals well, but have poor control over perennials. So just like when I talked about flame weeding, contact herbicides are like that. They can burn off the top, but that perennial weed still has a root system that can produce new foliage. Uh, they're usually non-selective. They don't uh, have a, um, a, a preference. They will control grasses or broadleaf weeds. An example is Rimoxone or Paraquat. This is a restricted use herbicide. It is not one you can buy without a restricted applicator's license. Uh, a systemic herbicide. So these are absorbed through the plant tissues and translocated to their site of activity. Um, they are also temperature dependent. Uh, they have variable soil activity depending on what it is. Typically effective on both annuals and perennials because they move through the plant and both selective and non-selective forms. Uh, so example of this is uh, everybody's familiar with the term Roundup or um, the active ingredient of that is glyphosate. It moves through the plant. Uh, so I said selective versus non-selective in range of activity. So selective targets a specific range of species. So an example of that um, would be manage, which the chemical ingredient is halosulfuron, and that's used for nut sedge. Uh, 2,4-D, commonly used in lawns uh, to control broadleaf weeds because it does not control grasses, it just controls broadleaves. Non-selective um, target a wide range of species. Uh, so an example, once again, is Roundup or glyphosate. That it will control whatever uh, you spray it on and it moves through that plant. 
We also have um, stages of growth. So we have herbicides that are called pre-emergent herbicides. They inhibit that germination of that seedling in the soil. They are usually selective. Uh, they can have a variable length of activity, how long that lasts in the soil. Uh, most commonly used to control annual weeds, um, once again, because that perennial weed uh, is established, it's not a germinating seed most of the time. An example of this that, that is commonly used in gardens is preen. Uh, preen is a soil pride uh, pre-emergent herbicide. We also have post-emergent herbicides. These kill the plants once they are up and actively growing. Uh, both selective and non-selective types, so grasses or broadleafs or all. Uh, once again, example round, Roundup or glyphosate. The number one rule of herbicides is the plants must be actively growing for that herbicide to work. So I'll get questions that somebody applied a herbicide, but it was 95 degrees out. That plant is not actively growing at 95 degrees out. Um, so it's not effective. All plants or all, all um, herbicides have a label. That label is the law and they will tell you specifically about um, restrictions on temperatures, uh, low or high, um, personal protective equipment, all of those things and rates are very, very important. So how herbicides work, they have to disrupt one or more vital plant processes in order to kill the plants. So these are all plant processes that can be modes of action uh, in how a herbicide works. So they can inhibit protein synthesis or photosynthesis, or they can cause rapid cell division, which causes the plant to kind of grow itself to death. Um, so all of these uh, can be um, mode of actions in how a herbicide works. We also have in herbicides, we have restricted versus non-restricted. So restricted use are typically due, are called restricted use due to toxicity or risk to water. And um, they are restricted to, you have to have a pesticide applicator's license in order to purchase those, which means you went through training and have a license uh, to understand more about uh, that, that uh, pesticide and be able to purchase it and use it correctly. Not restricted, but anybody can go out to, to the store and purchase. On that label, remember that label is the law and follow that label. It's not a little bit is good and more is better. No. <laughs> uh, Think and read that label. Uh, that label will tell about toxicity. Uh, it'll give you signal words. It'll give um, the harmful effects from oil, oral or dermal contact, inhalation, eye exposure. So it could have a poison, a caution, a warning, or danger. Um, so it goes through all of those uh, and it will tell you which of those it is. Remember, use that uh, PPE that we all know that term, personal protective equipment. That label tells you exactly what you need as far as that goes. And that herbicide label will also tell you if you need an adjuvant. Uh, that's whether it's an insecticide or fungicide also. All of this applies about that label on any pesticide that you use. Uh, adjuvants, uh, they can be added um, to improve herbicide activity, performance, application. Uh, so it could help anti-foaming, drift control, compatibility, getting that water to mix with that uh, concentrated herbicide. It can increase absorption, rain fastness, uh, decrease photodegradation. So when light uh, hits and breaks something down. Uh, so this includes surfactants, emulsifiers, some cases it could be diesel fuel or kerosene that is added. Uh, they help mix diesel mix with water. Uh, so that label is going to tell you if it needs an adjuvant, um, but adjuvants can be important in how effective a, a herbicide is.
There's also ways to tank mix herbicide or tank mix. Um, sometimes it is herbicides, although more commonly we see it in um, with fungicides and insecticides together as opposed to herbicides, but um, it can save cost and labor. So in herbicides, it would might be mixing a broadleaf herbicide with a grass herbicide. Um, some cases it can increase control. Uh, the, those tank mixes can be common. Illegal to mix pesticides if such mixtures are prohibited on the label. Remember, reading that label is going to give you a world of information. If you don't understand the label, call one of us. That's what we're here for. I read and look up labels a lot and help uh, decipher some of them. If no guidance is given, it's your responsibility to make sure the pesticides retain their properties. And also something to think about is water pH. Uh, it can have reduced activity uh, of herbicides when the hard water is used as a carrier. Uh, I don't know about where everyone is in the state, but uh, here where I'm at, we do have a hard water and it can be a problem, more so with insecticides than herbicides, but um, remember to consider that. And the reason for that is that herbicide can bind to those calcium ions in the hard water and that can inactivate the herbicide. And that label, once again, world of information um, can help you uh, determine what water pH recommendations it has. So those are just a bunch of different options for controlling uh, those pesky weed problems. So remember, identify that critical weed problem, consider why they might be thriving, learn more about that weed and devise that management plan. And uh, as far as identifying weeds, I do a lot of that, um, but I have a whole bunch of weed books here on my desk. That is still my favorite way to identify weeds is using a book form uh, to look through and figure out what that actual weed might be. All right, I think we've got some time for questions if anybody has any. Katie, there, there have been a number of questions coming in. To All the right. Box. Uh, Debbie and others have been answering some of them, but I've written down a few that I don't think have been answered yet. One was concerning plastic mulch. Will it hurt or harm my soil? So um, it really doesn't hurt or harm your soil. It just, it doesn't add anything to it like organic mulch does. And if you are moving through it, it, it can be a disposal issue, uh, you know, and it, it doesn't last forever either. So um, doesn't, it doesn't really hurt anything. It's, it's there <laughs> and, and it does help with a lot of weeds. Although some weeds are, are very good at once again at what they do. Uh, yellow nut sedge will go through black plastic or landscape fabric or any of those. Another one was how can you mulch four inches deep but yet keep the mulch from touching your plants? So it's once again keeping it back away from, from those plants. Uh, you can get pretty close to the plants without touching. Uh, and, um, you know, you're also thinking four inch deep of straw. When it's fresh, it's four inches, but guess what? It eventually compacts. Uh, so, so still remember, particularly like if you're talking about vegetables or annuals, um, those have very tender stems. And you really don't want to bury those with uh, uh, mulch next to them. Another question. Can grass crippings from treated lawns be used as a mulch? Depends on what the treatment is. Right. Uh, and and um, I don't know of any lawn herbicides that carry through. Um, we do have some problems with some pasture herbicides that carry through manure sources and can cause problems. But typically what we apply on the lawns doesn't, um, but it really is gonna depend on what was that, what that treatment was. Right, uh, I was going to mention 
that you, now that you brought up the subject, I work quite a bit with vegetable growers. And of course, tomato is a very popular vegetable, both commercially speaking in home garden. And we've got to be careful with what we use as mulch on tomatoes. Uh, I know of a case where an individual got some spoiled hay from a stable and used it to mulch their tomatoes and they lost their entire crop. Making matters worse, they weren't able to grow anything in the same place next, the following year. And it traced back to broadleaf herbicides, which are used on hay land or pasture land to kill off broad leaves and make for very nice grassy forage or hay. Uh, these materials, and the chlorum is an example, can stay on the mulch and then be washed into the soil, or they can actually go through the alimentary canal of a horse or a cow. And if we use the bedding as compost, it's still viable enough to adversely affect a very sensitive species such as tomato. Uh, one person commented, what about the uh, loss of insects if we control weeds? In other words, it, it, it's a quandary between insects and weeds. So the reality is that um, herbicides, yeah, do not control insects. They control weeds that might be a host for insects. Uh, and it is knowing which ones are weeds and it's controlling things in certain ways. It's still protecting the pollinators because, yes, I use herbicides in um, around my house, around my garden. I use them according to the label, but yet I depend on those pollinators be, to pollinate my pumpkin crop. Uh, so it is figuring out that balance. And quite honestly, the weeds that are in my pumpkin patch are not weeds that um, attract desirable insects. Uh, and um, I can control those weeds and prevent those weeds from germinating. While I have a huge planting of native plants that are providing those pollinators and it's knowing what those host plants are and figuring out that give and take between it. Uh, I feel compelled to address a comment that somebody put on suggesting that poison ivy dies during the winter. <laughs> poison ivy is a woody plant. It's a deciduous plant, it sheds its leaves during the winter, but on the other hand, it's gonna be back probably in fuller force the following spring. And so you can it still, is not an annual weed. That, you can uh, still get poison ivy in the winter too. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes you Even can. without the leaves, that, that oil is still volatile in that plant. <laughs> Got it. Any other questions? We have There's time one. for a quick story. I was addressing vegetable growers on something probably having to do with tomatoes. And we were talking about weed control between the rows and some options. And we mentioned this and that and the other thing. And then a hand popped up in the back and they said, well, Dave, you forgot to mention the Santa Claus method. Well, like a big catfish, I took the bait and I said, well, I don't know that I I'm familiar with the Santa Claus method. They said, that's the one where you go, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> now you're grown. <laughs> and, and the reality is no weed is immune to that ho. <laughs> that's true. Uh, somebody just put in the box, don't breathe the smoke of poison ivy that you're burning. And that's absolutely true. I know of a young man who almost lost his life because of that being very, very sensitive to poison ivy. And that's where that weed ID comes in very handy in knowing what those exactly. are. Exactly, exactly. Any well, final, one. we have about uh, one minute left. <laughs> Any so final Katie, question? Yeah, Katie, there's one question that came in. They wanted to know what is your favorite 
book when it comes to weeds? So actually, I, all right. So I actually have um, four or five books that I use most commonly. Um, one is Weeds of the Midwestern United States and Central Canada. One is Weeds of the South. I also have a Weeds of the Northeast and uh, a Weeds of Southern Turf Grass. There are many, many more out there, but these are the ones that I most commonly use and keep on, on my desk in easy reach. Okay, very good. Thank you very much.